All right, let's get started here. Like I said, it's been a tough day if you're a Twins fan. Twins have been swept in Detroit, in Motown, by the Tigers. The Twins have now lost, I believe, four in a row. The Tigers have won three straight series now. Uh, Minnesota, by the end of the night, might be in third place in the American League Central, and of course, still a playoff team. But welcome to the post-game pint from Twins Daily. My name is Seth Stoas. Uh, I'm joined tonight on the panel by Matthew Trueblood. Um, and we again welcome you to leave your comments in the chat area, which is open. The Q&A, which you can see at the bottom, we're going to do a couple of polls and try to try to talk our way through this. Uh, so let's uh, let's get started. I do want to thank you all for joining and welcome you to be a participant as well. Um, let's start with uh, Matt. Uh, man, we've got, it's only 5.30. It's not even 5.30 yet. And so we're going to have some time to probably... Drink away the evening if people so choose, but uh, what's your post-game plan? I have not grabbed anything yet. Uh, we're going to have dinner in not too long, so I guess I'll <laughs> probably have a beer or two with that, but for now it's just water. So in other words, we got to keep this one short, so we better get rolling. And of course, I have the Diet Dr. Pepper, so good work, good for us. So let's let's start right away. Obviously a tough day, but Matt, but, uh, what was kind of your number one take of, of the day? Well, I mean, the Twins offense across two games scored four runs, and Nelson Cruz accounted for half of that just with homers. And that's against a pair of Tigers left-handed starters. And then they closed out the game today with uh, Gregory Soto, who's another tough lefty. Now they put together some decent at-bats, but my big takeaway is something we already kind of knew, uh, but this throws it into especially glaring relief. The Twins need some type of right-handed punch against left-handed pitching uh, and they need it now. They, they can't necessarily just wait and hope that Byron Buxton, Josh Donaldson, and Mitch Garver all come back. I'll come back at full strength and hitting the way they did last year, which, you know, Garver already shows us that that's no guarantee. I think by Monday, they should be looking to add a right-handed bat to give them a little bit more, uh, consistency is really I think the thing that's missing from the offense right now all right and I, I want to come back to that but in order to kind of keep us going here a little bit I'm going to bring in um, another Twins Daily Writer real quick here to our panel to represent the panelists uh, today and uh, hopefully give us his thought uh, Nate Palmer has done some articles including this past week uh, and we welcome him in to give his his uh, Twins take of the day, uh, Nate, you mentioned you didn't get a chance to watch the second game, but what are your general thoughts on the sweep today at the hands of the Tigers? Yeah, um, yeah, like it's, I got blacked out being in Wisconsin here for some reason, or maybe just my YouTube TV is not working well for me as we're packing up our house. But uh, I, I do echo Matt. Um, I might be able to share a little take that I put out on Twitter earlier Uh but my big thing right now is I'm getting really worried about these home runs out of the pen. Uh, it just – uh, we saw the bend don't break uh, not too long ago from the pen. But now we're just seeing I mean, two home runs in that second game going out. Uh, we've got to figure out – you know, the team's got to figure out somehow to bring those back. And, and maybe it's just uh, a moment in time and it will come back around. Uh, but – that's starting to worry me, especially with as much as we're putting on that bullpen. And we're not getting as many home runs on our side offensively either anymore. So I've uh, got to figure out something there. I am muted, but I did thank you very much for, uh, now I'll just thank you twice, uh, for joining us here to give us that take. We're going to go through the MVP in just a minute here before I give my take, but I'm going to I'm going to have you, uh, have you uh, logged off here and then uh, stop back. So if you just want to block yourself out or however you want to do that, that'd be just fine. I'm going to give my Twins take of the day. And again, uh, you know, I tweet it often and I kind of echo you guys in saying Twins are down by two runs in the uh, fifth or sixth or even the fourth inning and you feel like the game's over. And that's a tough thing right now for an offense to be expected so much of. You mentioned right-handed batting or hitting. Uh, Mitch Garver's out. Josh Donaldson was supposed to be a huge part of that. He played seven games this year, so that's a huge thing. Fortunately, they've got Nelson Cruz still. 
And I mean, Miguel Sano is hitting right now and he got robbed of the home run today. But I guess my take is going to be, you know, the, the pitching as well is a little bit scary. Um, you know, Randy Dobnik gave up, I think, 12 hits in game one in about four and a third innings. And some of them, some of them just found holes, but a lot of them were 95 plus miles per hour too. So that was a concern today. They needed to go to the bullpen game again. And at some point, these guys, these it's just not fair to expect this many guys, three, four, five guys to come out of the bullpen, even in a short game and continue to be good. So uh, you know, they need Stashak back. They need Littell back. They need Donaldson, Garver, Buxton. I'm at the point right now where I'm just not sure what this team is because right now I don't think it's a fluke to get swept by the Tigers. And that sounds terrible to say, but I don't see it as a fluke. So not even sure what my take was there. They threw five pitchers in a bullpen game in the seven inning game and uh, just a frustrating day. And so I'm going to put up this poll. Um, Matt, True Blood, your uh, comment was on them needing bats, and specifically, they got to figure out how to hit left-handed bats. Um, Nate Palmer took over the panelists, so vote for him if, if you enjoyed his take. And my take was kind of all over the place, and, and ultimately it was that I don't think it's shocking right now that they got um, it, that they got swept by the Tigers. So that tells you kind of where they're at and where they need to get over the next month. So... I'm not exactly sure. I'm going to launch this poll right now. And uh, we got a few people to vote. And let's see how this one goes. But, Matt, I want to get back to your point. Um, and it's been a conversation on Twitter today throughout this game and really recently. What do they need to do, um, especially against left-handed pitching? Because, like you said, Scooble looked terrific. Matthew Boyd, who's been terrible all year, looked terrific. Um, you know, like you said, Gregory Soto. I mean, first of all, these guys all throw like – well, Scooble and, and uh, Soto both throw like 98. So uh, it's not easy by any means. And this, uh, we get to see uh, Casey Mize tomorrow and see what he's got. So, um, you know, we're just going to end this poll right here. Matthew Trueblood dominating the first poll. Uh, so we'll just end that one and give him credit for the first win. What do they do? Donaldson, hopefully, I, from reading between the lines, hopefully can be back soon. Mitch Garver might be a while. Uh, is Brent Rooker the answer? What do you, what do you think? So, I mean, obviously Donaldson coming back would be such a huge shot in the arm. He he changes the complexion of the entire lineup, the defense, the offense. Um, he gives you so many more options the second he steps back in, as long as he's fully himself. Um, my thing, I guess my spin on what you said, your twins take, sort of saying that it doesn't feel shocking that the – Tigers swept this today, and right now it's hard to know what this Twins team is. I think the way I would put it is, this is a very good team. We've known that all along. We've known it's a very deep team. Um, at this point, that depth is being tested and even uh, sort of overstretched and starting to tear in places by injuries and by some ineffectiveness that can be, it can be explained, but that doesn't mean it can easily be solved. Uh, so to me, getting Donaldson back would be huge. I still, because I, I'm looking, you know, you've got to think about as you're coming up over the next couple of days to the trade deadline, you've got to think about all of September and you've got to think about October too. And last year, the Twins kind of got everyone healthy, nominally healthy, air quotes healthy, going into the playoffs. But we saw them not play like themselves against the Yankees. And it was because Eddie Rosario was on a bad ankle. Jorge Polanco was on a bad foot. Max Kepler's shoulder or back or whatever was still not fully right. And that, that was pretty clear. Luis Arias was playing, but playing through a knee injury that's followed him all the way into this season. Uh, there's a risk that that's exactly what's going to happen again this year. And that's why I think more than maybe most people I want to see the Twins be active and aggressive at this trade deadline. It doesn't mean giving up on any of the key players in your core. It doesn't mean selling the farm, you know, and going out and making a huge splash. But there are a couple of spots on this roster where it would be easy to make small to medium-sized upgrades. And I think if you do that, you're going to feel very grateful in three weeks or even four weeks as you're coming up on the playoffs, wherever you fit into the playoffs at that point. And, maybe you've gotten everyone back and healthy and it just feels like you made almost superfluous additions, uh, but maybe not. And maybe those couple of guys that you could add at a relatively low cost 
are stabilizing things in a way that right now, a Ray Adrianza isn't able to stabilize, you know, this, this hurting position player core. And uh, maybe Matt Whistler and some of the guys who are filling out the middle part of the bullpen right now aren't enough to stabilize a bullpen that's having a lot demanded of it. Uh, so that's, I think, where I stand right now. Yeah, let's, Nate, if you're there, we can bring you in to, to kind of add your thoughts to that as well. Um, you know, I mean, it, it is a good team. I think we can all agree with that. But guys that are were expected to be part-timers or middle innings or low leverage are getting stretched into high leverage situations or playing every day. Um, you know, that's a big deal. So what are you looking for over the next few days as we approach the, the trade deadline? If you were to if you were to pick one key thing for you from your perspective. I've been slow churning this for a week or so now as I just kind of been watching games. Um, and it's always, if you could pick up an impact picture, pitcher, you, you always want to do that. Um, and I almost hate saying this because I, I love Jake Cave for this unknown reason, but I've been wondering about Kevin Pillar. Uh, he's not going to be a huge bat, but he's a righty. He comes in and he will balance it out. He's not maybe the same defensive outfielder he's been in the past, but he's still going to add some good defense. Just wonder if he might be that good complement just to extend that bench a little bit more, um, make that depth a little bit better. I, I wouldn't want to, you know, maybe really pay too much up for him, but give something up uh, to see if that could just add a little veteran presence, um, add that right-handed bat, uh, and, and get something else a little bit more in there uh, to – I, and really, at that point, whether you keep Cave or Wade on the on the roster from there, you know I, that doesn't matter so much to me. Even though um, I, like I said, I have this unexplainable love for Jake Cave, and I don't know what it is. Uh, but yeah, that Kevin Pillar has been the name that's been just churning in my head. All right, Nate, we're going to give you probably an easy one. Uh, Matt Trueblood was the unanimous winner of question number one. We'll give you question number two. Who is your Twins player of the day today? <laughs> I'm glad you did that because I actually – I was probably going to end up going with Jake Cave because I was afraid I was going to be the last because I heard he had a good catch. So someone can steal that. But I'll go with Nelson Cruz. I mean, I think that's – we all know that one's coming. He hit some home runs. It's Nelson Cruz. Well done. Um <laughs> Matt, do you have a choice for the Twins? Uh, let's just be honest. Who, who's the second choice if you had to pick a second choice for Twins MVP today? I'm going to say something that you don't have to believe, and I'm not even 100% sure I believe it. But I was <laughs> thinking about passing up Nelson Cruz anyway if I had gotten first choice to say I continue to be impressed by Eddie Rosario in this season where I think it, no one knew quite how much to expect of him. There were trade rumors kind of floating around. There was an idea that Alex Kirilov and Trevor Larnick were coming for his job like right now. He's impressed me with his situational awareness and his willingness to do whatever the team needs uh, throughout this season. In game two today, he had, first of all, he had a hit leading off the second inning against a tough lefty, Tarek Skubal. Lord knows if, if even the lefties on this team could start hitting lefties, that'd be great. Um, he did that, but the key play to me was then Miguel Sano hits a hard line drive single to left field. And Rosario saw that because of how hard that ball was hit and the nature of the defender the Tigers had out there, Kristen Stewart, that he wasn't able to charge that thing and, and get to it aggressively, even though it was hit hard. And he made it to third on that play. That set him up to score on Marwin Gonzalez's sack fly. Uh, in the seventh inning, I almost said the ninth inning, in the seventh inning of the game, then he drew a tough walk against another tough lefty, throwing 98 with a nasty slider. Uh, Eddie Rosario, and hopefully this injury that then took him out of the game is not going to turn out to be anything too serious, but yeah. he has stepped up in a lot of those small ways and made big plays doing the small things for this team this year, which has not, unfortunately, been the specialty of this team for the balance of this season. Yeah, and it's really going to be curious to see what happened there because he took the walk, and like you said, against a lefty throw in 98 with a slider, and then he kind of hopped down the first base line, and I don't know if he popped a muscle hopping or if something happened on a check swing or, you know, what, but they did take him out. It looked like he tried to stay in, and Tommy Watkins was over there saying, I, I don't know. But a lot of people think I'm kidding when I say 
frequently on Twitter, hashtag, I love, or have I ever mentioned how much I love watching Eddie Rosario play baseball? It's that stuff that you're talking about, Matt. It's him taking third base when nobody would take third base. And you know what? He gets thrown out doing that every once in a while, but I love that aggressiveness. Um, sometimes he's going to look bad by it. You know, sometimes those throws he makes end up going over the, you know, catcher's head by 30 feet, but I love the aggressiveness. And in that case, it was an extra run. And right now the twins need to do everything they can to score any runs. So, um, so my MVP is no one. I think that's the best vote I've got. You know, maybe I'm even going to give myself a vote. You know, I could go with the Jake Cave catch because he did rob a, a home run from Cameron Mabin. Um, but that's all I got. So I'm going to go with no one, and I'm going to launch that poll right now. Hopefully we get a few more votes here. Um, who made the best case? Uh, the panelist uh, The panelist in the situation you're about to see is uh, Nate Palmer, and he went with Nelson Cruz. Tough choice. Matt Trueblood went with Eddie Rosario, and I went with no one. So get your votes in. We got a few more seconds. We'll let this one play out, uh, who you think your MVP was. While we do that real quick, we're going to talk to Matt a little bit. He's been pretty busy this week talking a little, writing a little bit about the upcoming trade deadline. So we'll get his thoughts on that. As we're – final people are checking out, out your uh, MVP vote. We're just going to call it – I did get two votes for voting for no one for player of the game today, but the winner is Nelson Cruz. Congratulations, yeah. Nate Palmer. You win that one. Uh, again, just a quick reminder, we'll, uh, we'll answer, your, answer your questions. Uh, we'll probably be doing one more poll here as we go. And But real quick, we have someone raising their hand. Jeffrey Hoffman, I believe that right now, if you unmute yourself, you will be able to ask us a question or give us your thoughts. Feel free to do so. Hey guys, um, thanks for doing this because I'm sure after a day like today, this isn't the easiest uh, thing to want to do in your spare time. And also, <laughs> I feel kind of dumb. I'm doing this in my also spare time. But I did have a, a, a few questions, although before I have three, three quick questions and one quick comment, I completely agree with Rosario. Um, for every time you want to rip your hair out, you forget about the three times that you're clapping. Well, I'm almost the same way you are, Seth. <laughs> um, but anyways, like, you got to take take the good, take the bad, the facts of life kind of thing. It's like, you know, he'll frustrate you one minute, but you forget about the three little things he does in the game that stopped, saved a run or created a run, even if it's not immediate, you know. Stopping the guy from going from a, a, a double to holding him to a single or him getting a double when it should have been a single. So anyways, but my three quick questions are, Donaldson scares me because not just because they don't want to rush him for him to re-aggravate his perennial uh, calf injuries, but he wasn't good before he was <laughs> playing and I know it was a very small sample size understand but he concerns me I'm like he's not the savior we don't know what we're gonna get back when Buxton comes back it's just too many it's thinking about too many different things <clears throat> that it's not get, nothing's guaranteed you know and that's life um and then my okay. second and then my second question was and this is like, this is very esoteric, but there just seems to be no urgency in the team. And I know baseball is a whole different game. I forget the football coach. There's some football coach that was in the Major League Baseball uh, clubhouse before a game started. And he was amazed at the low energy. And the, the coach of the baseball team was like, we can't do this 162. We can't be pounding each other's shoulders 162 times a year. You know, it's slow and steady. But we're not even – we're down to less than 30 games right now. You know? I mean, Ooh. that's just – and then my, my, thir my third point, point was um, I'm sure we're going to make the playoffs. I'm, I'm not here to be all doom and gloom. You know, I'm a Twins fan. This is a really good – this is a great Twins team. We're just underperforming. My problem is, is – I hate the idea, like, we'll make the playoffs, which is cool, which is good. It, just in a very weird year. 
But the thing that I find that goes back to my sense of urgency is wouldn't you rather finish as ahead as you can in the division so you get to choose the team you play instead of another team chooses you, which is kind of a little humiliating. I mean, that's going to be kind of a humiliating threat. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, no, it's, and, yep. and also, it's going, to be, it's, going to be more, it's going to be more humiliating if, if the Yankees are just one above us or, or they're the number one and, like, we're the number four, and they choose us over the five, six, or six, seven, eight, eight. you know, that will just be the ultimate um, slap. <gasps> Understood. Hey, Jeffrey, thank you very much. I did jot down all three of your questions. I didn't mean to take up so much of your time. I just I just was making thoughts that I had during the game. And Yeah, that's great. We appreciate that. And the two losses in Detroit is tough. I think the Tigers are better. I think Joe Vavra being their hitting coach is a good thing. I actually think that Rick Anderson probably deserves a little credit and will be interested to see how he works with their plethora of pitching talent. And Guardy deserves some credit, too. But we'll get through your questions. And uh, the only thing we need to do is make sure Matt Trueblood gets to supper on time. So we'll get Okay. Hey, I'm sorry, guys. I pre- hey, appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, Matt, we got some questions here. Um, yeah. Let's start with the first one. And, and it is one that I got a ton today. And that's, what do we even think of Josh Donaldson? He played, I think, six or seven games. He wasn't good. But that happens. I mean, it's a week. So I'm not I'm not worried about him. But I, I sense that a lot of Twins fans – I had one person on Twitter, I think, say that, well, he hadn't proven himself yet. And I was like, Josh Donaldson <laughs> hasn't proven himself? I mean, he's got like an MVP and all this. Well, he hasn't proven himself with the Twins yet. And I don't even know how to respond to that. So, Matt, what, what do you think? Well, how do I respond to that one? Yeah, I think if you are expecting Josh Donaldson to prove himself to you um, – you got to just widen your scope a little bit. Uh, if he hadn't proven himself, the Twins wouldn't have signed him for four years and up to $100 million this offseason. The Twins don't do that. They did it for this guy. It's because he's a former MVP. He's played a couple other seasons at near MVP levels. Um, the fact that he struggled for a week and maybe wasn't fully healthy during that week, it's hard to know. Um, but, you know, it doesn't feel like he was at 100% preparedness and health even during that period uh, that doesn't concern me now that doesn't mean you can't have legitimate concerns about Donaldson because this is a guy who's pushing 35 this is a guy who has had this exact injury before and it kept him out for a long time and when he was on the field during the seasons that he was dealing with that previous calf injury he was somewhat limited he wasn't quite the same guy And some of the kinetics of his swing tell you why that might be. Uh, So it's reasonable to be a little concerned about Donaldson. I think when he comes back that you should basically keep as your default expectation, this guy's going to be Josh Donaldson, not from 2015 when he won the MVP and he was younger and he hadn't had these injuries, but from last year, the guy that the Twins were essentially signing, a very patient hitter, a hitter who's vulnerable to swinging and missing, but generates a ton of power, gives you good at bats and brings it to sort of transition a little bit to that second question, though I still want to hear what you think on this first one. Uh, Donaldson's going to bring that urgency. He's going to bring that red ass to the team the moment that he's back, not just in the clubhouse, but on, you know, in the lineup and on the field with the team every day, he's going to make a difference on that energy level too. Yeah, and I think it is a fair point to say both with Donaldson. I mean, he's now missed a little over a month. He's not going to jump right back in. and I mean, maybe he will, but there's no way to know that he'll jump back in at 100%. Uh, Mitch Garver with with an uh, intercostal or side injury, I mean, one, we don't know when he'll be back. It could be a while. Two, you don't know how he's going to feel swinging. Um, Buxton, I mean, you know, he's always a little bit of a slow starter. And the fact that there isn't a Rochester or even a Fort Myers to go to get some live at bats, other than in the same point where they're sure that he's going to hit against Joan Duran and Dakota Chalmers and, you know, guys that are over there. But, you know, we just don't know. So I think that is a fair question. Ideally, perfect world situation. These guys would be back within the next two weeks and have three weeks to get ready for a playoff run to at least get some at-bats under their under their uh, belt and, and to get some ground balls and to feel comfortable. 
And, and with Donaldson specifically, we saw Aaron Judge come back, and within about four innings, he was done and put back on the injured list. And the Twins don't want that. Josh Donaldson doesn't want that. And the other thing that bothers me about that conversation is, you know how many people want to put big money uh, third baseman as their quote? Because obviously that has nothing to do with his injuries. So, uh, But the urgency is another topic that I think comes up, and I agree with completely with Jeffrey, uh, the caller, when he said – it's not football. You can't, you can't push every single day. And I also think players need to find their own motivation in their at-bats and when they're in the field and that kind of thing. I don't know how to answer that one because there has to be an urgency, and I really think Baldelli and his uh, approach is great, especially this season when there's so much going on beyond the quote-unquote normal. Um, I mean, how do, you, how do you respond to that, Matt? I mean, it's just – it's not a normal year, and I think you have to have someone who is willing and able to think outside the block, box. But at the same time, you're now in a three-team race, and you don't want to be uh, – I mean, ideally, I think, you know, the other thing he says is you don't want to be number eight. You'd prefer to be number one. I mean, so you're, you're doing this patience thing with wanting to get a higher seed. So it's a tough thing to do. Yeah, it's – I definitely agree that you can't approach it the same way you do in football. Um, you know, there's, and I know not everyone has got the time to grab a couple of books and curl up, but I really recommend to people, if you want to understand the, the way that baseball works inside a player, um, the stuff that stats aren't going to capture, and often we can't see just by watching, read The Mental Game of Baseball, by Harvey Dorfman, um, read, uh, I think it's 90% Mental by Bob Tewksbury. These are excellent books about the way that you do have to bring an energy in the form of focus and consistent concentration um, and a sort of short memory of, in terms of moving on from adversity to the ballpark and to every inning of every game. That's the level at which a baseball player has to uh, has to win the the mental and the emotional game. It's not about just getting the blood pumping. It's not adrenaline isn't going to win for you most of the time. What does is being able to stay in the moment and have full focus and awareness without getting distracted. It's a fine line to walk, and it's something the twins have done pretty well, um, but that is especially hard to manage at a time like this when there's a pandemic going on. There aren't fans in the stands. You're constantly aware of the strangeness of this season. And now uh, to have racial issues, you know, encircling the game, uh, entangling the game the way they are too. Um, these are challenges and you don't necessarily want players to just shut down and be, be sociopaths for the sake of winning ball games. Um, but you do have to be able to kind of, get on the field and maintain a full focus on what you're doing in that moment. That's going to be the twins challenge for the stretch. It's something that Baldelli was able to cultivate in them last year. Part of the reason that it might be harder this year, in addition to all those things, I just listed the external things is that a lot of the coaching staff has turned over since last year. So a lot of the ways, the culture of the clubhouse that was shaped by many of those coaches has had to kind of be rebuilt and they haven't had a lot of time to do it because of the interruptions. Yeah, sorry. First of all, I had to move because I've got one of those doors that has just a little glass in it that the sun was just driving me crazy. But, you know, I think that does speak again to the third question from Jeffrey, which was just, we will, they will make the playoffs. Um, but you don't want to just make it. This year, was ex the expectations were higher. And as much as it's easy for me to sit back and say, okay, a lot of weird stuff is going on, uh, plus all the injuries, you know, you kind of want to use that as an excuse, but it's, it's also the reality. And I do think the depth that they compiled was a good thing, and it's getting tested. I, I feel like that number three, Jeffrey, might have been more of a statement that, you know, you still want to make sure that there's enough urgency so that the goal is to finish as high in the seating as possible. Um, and, and maybe a good example to be used was the fact was the Yankees. I mean, they've lost like five in a row, and they've got the same things going on as the Twins. Tampa Bay is kind of taken off here. So here, here's one that I want to ask you real quick before we get uh, going. Matt, 
the Royals today traded Trevor Rosenthal to the Padres for a couple of players. Um, the one thing that alarms me a little bit is the Twins went five and five against the Royals. They're currently zero and two against the Tigers. The Tigers may trade guys over the weekend. The Royals are going to start trading those guys that help beat the Twins, and now Cleveland and Chicago are going to get to play those teams with lesser players. So, I mean, that all kind of plays together that this is not going to be easy down the stretch. Yeah. One of the pieces I wrote actually at Baseball Perspectives, not at Twins Daily this past week, was about uh, the unusual way that the AL Central has become a pennant race in a season that is allergic to pennant races, right? Where we all thought, well, it's all just a race for seeding. Um, it's 60 games, so you don't have a chance for much drama to really develop. If there are three teams racing this close together, then a lot of drama develops because now to clean up a little bit of what Jeffrey was talking about, they had toyed with the idea of letting teams pick their opponents um, for the playoffs this year. That ended up getting tabled. It's just going to be the number one seed against the number eight seed, two against seven, three against six, four against five. But right. because of that, because that's the way we're doing things, the playoffs have been collapsed into far more of a crapshoot than baseball playoffs already kind of are. So if we're searching for any sort of meaning in this season, part of it does have to just come from winning the division, right? Like you have to assert your superiority over those 60 games just to say, you know, it, we did something and we actually proved we're the best team. Even if you make it to the playoffs, it'll still be great if the Twins make a deep run, but we'll kind of be aware that that was a dice roll. And if the dice roll comes up snake eyes for the Twins and they don't make it out of the first round or something, uh, then we're going to want to at least lean on, well, for those 60 games, we really showed something. And they're running out of time to do that. And because of the structure of these playoffs where the, first, the division winners get the first three seeds the runners-up get the second three seeds, no matter what your records are. The Twins could conceivably, probably not, but could conceivably finish with the third best record in the American League. But if the first two are the Indians and the Twins, the Twins would have the seventh seed, uh, and they would end up playing the Rays or the Oakland A's in the first round as the visiting team. Uh, so it does matter. The regular season matters. They're, they kind of wafted through this easy part of the schedule and missed their opportunities to, to create a cushion for themselves. So now it's buckle down time. And that's, again, I say, I want to see them add a little bit to this roster. It's because even if guys come back healthy, you're going to want to kick hard down this stretch. You're going to want to show something both for the sake of the exercise of the season, but also to make sure you're in as favorable a, a position as possible and as ready as possible uh, in terms of building a great playoff roster once you get there. So let's spend the last few minutes. And again, those of you listening, thank you for listening. Feel free to leave some questions in the chat room if you have some. Um, specifically, we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about uh, really Matthew's articles throughout this week. And you wrote an article on three left-handed relievers to consider, three right-handed relievers to consider, a uh, right-handed bat, and maybe starting pitching. Was that the third one? But along with that, or the fourth one, along with that, we did hear today that the Twins are among several teams, including the White Sox, who are apparently at least looking into the idea of, of Dylan Bundy of the Angels. So before getting to your specific position-by-position position topics, which of those do you feel is the most important area for the Twins to acquire if they had one, one move to make? doesn't have to be a huge splash, but if they had one move to make, what move, in your opinion, would that be? For me, a right-handed bat with some real thump and ideally some versatility um, because I don't, it's hard to forecast exactly where the hole is going to be in this lineup once people start to get healthier, once people start to maybe play a, a bit more up to their potential. Um, but there's still going to be a spot. And if you can add a right-handed hitter who's just, he's a clearly above league average hitter, uh, who can also move around to a couple of positions, that's the one thing that would make a big difference no matter how all the variables of who's healthy, who's not, who's hitting well, who's not uh, fall out over the next few weeks. So real quickly on Twitter, it's been announced that Eddie Rosario has a sore ankle. 
Um, it's something they had talked about in the dugout prior to that at bat or that plate appearance, and they decided to take him out. So I doubt that it's a 10-day kind of thing. But I want to ask you this, and I, I encourage everyone who's listening, go to twinsdaily.com, check it out. Over the last couple of days or over the last few days, just kind of scroll down. You'll find all of Matt's articles. Um, but if you were to pick one right-handed bat, you know, there there's some big names. Nate Palmer earlier mentioned Kevin Pillar. Brent Rooker maybe fits into this conversation to some degree. And you mentioned three guys. Uh, where are you looking specifically? I think at a sheer uh, – who do I have the most confidence would come in and improve the Twins materially for the rest of the season and into October? Uh, it's Donovan Solano for the San Francisco Giants. Far from a household name. Uh, this is a guy who came up almost a decade ago, played a couple of seasons with the Marlins, uh, got traded to the Yankees – fell off the MLB map, but since he made it back with last year's Giants, this is a guy who has hit, I think it was, it was 340 at the time I published my article, across almost 500 plate appearances. Uh, it's not fluky. He, he doesn't generate a ton of power, although, you know, everybody in the league at this point has a modicum of power, you know. Um, he's just above Luis Arias on the power level but he does something else that's just like a rise, which is almost everything off his bat is kind of that low line drive tra trajectory. Very hard to defend. He's going to find open grass with the ball at just a, a rate that you feel like isn't sustainable, but it is because of the way he does it and how consistently he does it. He's also a good athlete, a good defender at second or third base. He can even fill in at shortstop. And let's be honest with the way Jorge Polanco has been playing lately, it's not unimaginable that he might, you know, might need a game or two from a decent shortstop. Um, Solano's a great fit for the Twins. He's under team control through next season. Don't know for sure what the price tag looks like, but it's not going to be exorbitant. And if you can land a guy like that, it sort of changes, again, the complexion of the position player makeup while you're waiting and hoping for other guys to get healthy and find their groove. I'm going to bring Nate Palmer back here just a second. But while we're talking, Matt, about the Giants, do they have a relief pitcher or anyone else that you think would be able to be tied along with um, Solano um, in a potential two-player trade to kind of kill two stones with one bird? <laughs> yeah, they've got multiple options in that regard. Uh, Kevin Gossman is on the market. He's They picked him up this winter relatively cheaply as a starting starting option and he's looked good so far this year Gossman uh very kind of his money pitch is a splitter it reminds me a little bit of where Jake Odorizzi was in his career arc when the twins got him uh, now he's not maybe at that level I don't I don't want to say that if they brought in Gossman he'd take a leap like that one um but he's a solid sort of back-end starting option they could add to their mix. Uh, and the other option is someone I wrote about in the piece about left-handed reliever targets. That's Tony Watson, who will be a free agent at the end of this season, um, sort of a, a long-time veteran who's not throwing nearly as hard as he used to, but he's got a good slider and a good changeup, so he's able to work to lefties and righties relatively effectively, great at repeating his release point, not going to be a big walks problem, and is going to frustrate hitters uh, from the left side out of the bullpen, which I think is something the Twins could use too. So a couple of package options if they wanted to go that route. All right, thank you. And Gossman's a guy that I fully admit that in 2012, I wanted the Twins to take him out of, I believe, LSU uh, with the second overall pick instead of Byron Buxton. Um, even though I love high school, talented, raw, all that kind of stuff. And frankly, the Twins were right. But Gossman has been solid, and I think he could contribute down the stretch. Um, and Tony Watson, you mentioned the lefty. The Twins definitely could use another lefty uh, to go along with Taylor Rogers. Just be able to use a guy in the fifth or sixth inning or the seventh inning as opposed to just the eighth and the ninth, although Watson's been used in all of them over his long career as well. Um, but, Nate, I want to get to you real quick. Uh, you love Kevin Pillar. His name did come up late in the year when you think about – Rosario and Kepler in the corner outfield spots right now, the two backup outfielders and Wade and, and uh, Cave. 
are both left-handed. You look at Kirilov and, and Larnick are both left-handed. Uh, right-handed bat, can't hit, can't really play the field the way he used to. But what do you like about Kevin Pillar as I'm trying to sell him for you here? Yeah, well, I think it's it, – I we just look at um, – He's actually not hitting too bad this year. There's not a lot of power. He's just shy of 300 in his batting average. I was just looking not to – he's doing all right for the Red Sox. We'll hope that carries uh, in – I mean, the big thing, he's right-handed. He's going to still play enough defense out there to look pretty good. Uh, and I think the easy thing is probably trying to go for – just bring up Brent Rooker for that right-handed bat. But I don't, I don't know if he's going to be able to – is he a liability in the outfielder there at some point, though, especially just getting himself ready into the big leagues and, and having to think about catching up to pitching and everything where Pilar's been around, you really know what you're getting, um, that kind of a thing. I know the other place I would like to see some moves happen is just you know, some pitching, and it has to. I really think it has to be on that relief side, and maybe I think ideally it's someone who can fit into kind of that those middle innings uh, – what they've been trying to do with Thorpe and some others that somewhere in there. Uh, but I will pull off of one of Matthew's articles there. I've always been intrigued by Michael Givens and it would be just interesting to see what he would bring. Um, I know he wrote about him in his right-hander piece. And uh, even though there's lots of right-handers in that pen, I just think he's an interesting name uh, that if I'm going to throw one out there, uh, but ultimately, I've always trusted Belvin Levine. They they go find names that none of us are thinking about and somehow make them work, whether it's on the coaching side or the player side. It always seems the guys we're not watching are the ones they go get. Uh, so I always feel ever since this regime's taken over, it's always – it just – it feels like a failed uh, project to try and guess who they're going to go get, um, even though it's still fun. Uh, but they just seem to find those players that none of us are thinking about or looking at. And as I look at – St. Paul right now. I mean, offensively, you've got Rooker as a right-handed bat. To me, he makes more sense, I think, right now than, than Larnick or Kirilov, although both of those guys would probably potentially be a step up over um, Cave or maybe Wade. Um, but again, to sit on the bench probably doesn't make as, sense, as much sense, um, at least not yet, maybe later in the year, a playoff roster kind of thing. Uh, Pitching-wise, I mean, Duran and Chalmers are certainly interesting, but all of those names are kind of guys that you don't know what you're going to get. The potential is high, but you don't know how they'll handle it. Much like we talked about with, you know, when Garver comes back or Donaldson comes back, we don't know what they're going to do over a 20-game stretch or a 15-game stretch. So it's impossible necessarily to know what these younger guys do. And maybe it's a coin flip of what the quote unquote right decision to do is. Frankly, it's the same thing with Michael Pineda. So that is my next question for you, Matt, is um, I would say early next week, we will see Michael Pineda return. He's been pitching every six days in St. Paul and more recently it's been every five days. What is a fair expectation for him as he probably would make about four starts down the stretch? What, what are you anticipating from Michael Pineda's, Pineda's return? Well, I think he's a guy that you hope you can count on to come in and do pretty much what he normally does because what he normally does is, you know, he specializes in pounding the strike zone. He's not going to walk a lot of batters. Uh, he's not going to miss a ton of bats for a moderate, you know, a, a contemporary pitcher. Uh, and sometimes he's a little wild within the zone to the point where, you know, he, a good team might light him up for a couple of homers. You know, it might be risky to start him against the White Sox if you really need that victory or something. Uh, but for the most part, he's going to give you innings. He's going to give you stability. He's not going to lose the plate and force you to go get him in the third inning because he's at 80 pitches already. Um, if the Twins can just count on him for that kind of – he's a mid-rotation. He's not a top-of-the-rotation guy, per se. But – if they can count on him to be that steady, strike-throwing, consistent starter that they saw for most of last year, um, then they're going to get – that's pretty much all they need him to be because the rotation is pretty far down the list of major problems with this team, even as it is.
Unmute. Um, and, and you know, you mentioned Pineda is just, you're supposed to be able, reliable. Not great, but he's going to be reliable. And that's what Maeda was supposed to be. And that's what uh, Dominic has been along with Maeda. And Barrios is supposed to be reliable, but also potentially pretty good. And, and Odorizzi and Bailey were supposed to be reliable because this offense was supposed to be so good that all they had to do was be okay um, along with the bullpen and everything would be wonderful. So I do think it all comes down to that offense. Um, I, I, I feel like we need a tiebreaker question, but I, I think we're already sitting at time and I'm guessing uh, Matt Trueblood and everyone's getting hungry and supper's probably getting close. So I do want to leave everyone uh, with take 30 seconds to do two, well, take up 30 seconds to give one final take that you're looking forward to, whether it's at the trade deadline or in the coming week or so. And then secondly, what are you working on as far as, you know, at Twins Daily or, you know, Matt, obviously at, at, uh, at other positions as well. Uh, and Nate, same thing then. Say 30 seconds on what you're looking forward to and then something you're working on. We'll start with, uh, let's start with you, Matt. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to just seeing if the Twins do get aggressive in any way at the trade deadline. And I'm defining aggressive as just making a move. It's pretty easy to identify their needs. Um, the targets are maybe not as obvious as they would be in a normal season under very different, you know, financial and competitive circumstances. But we laid out a few of them at Twins Daily this week. And I want to see if they do add a bat, if they do go to the Angels who specialize in throwing tons of sliders like the Twins like to do now and snap up one or two of their pitchers. Um, bulk, bulk up in some way so we can feel a little more sure of what this team is going down the stretch. And maybe on that score at Twins Daily, at least early this week, I'm going to be writing about uh, Rich Hill, who told us, uh, told the media after his most recent start against Cleveland that he had added a cutter. Um, I got some interesting, I think, interesting thoughts on that. Um, and I'm going to look forward to digging into it more, uh, particularly given what his pitch mix was before he added that and some of his influences in, in deciding to add that pitch. Sounds great. Absolutely. Uh, that's another guy I didn't mention earlier who was supposed to be reliable, but he's, you know, at the same time, obviously he was coming back from a fairly significant uh, elbow thing as well, surgery. So, uh, and a new procedure. So we weren't really sure there either. Nate Palmer, obviously, thanks for joining here kind of last minute, but uh, I know you're moving a little bit. Uh, <laughs> That's fairly big. Uh, you're, you're, what you're looking forward to here in the next few days or the next week, uh, trade deadline-wise or other, and then some other projects you're working on? Yeah, well, looking for some Ws. I'm also just baseball-wise, I am very curious to see how many teams kind of take care or take um, use of this player-to-be-named later loophole that's kind of in there with the way things got written up. Uh, it's kind of that. You feel like you made a rule, but you really don't want to make the rule, so we'll just we'll kind of throw this in there. I'm just really interested to see how much that goes um, and happens and, and gets through. Uh, today I was just working on a piece just looking at what are the trade assets that the Twins might have, what are guys uh, either teams would be interested in or they just might be able to be floating out. Uh, I guess just as a teaser, uh, two of those names did not fare well today uh, in different ways, so uh, that – that may look like egg on the face a little bit if it, you know, when it hits uh, everyone's screens. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's been the most recent thing besides packing and moving. Yeah, fairly big thing there. Uh, for me, I want to, like you said, see some wins. I want to see the Twins at least be active or, or consider calling up some guys. I would also like to see them clone, uh, clone what Nelson Cruz does offensively along with Mel Miguel Sano does offensively. Um, into what Byron Buxton does in the outfield and Royce Lewis does potentially in the infield. And if they can clone that player um, and have nine or 12 or whatever of them, that would be absolutely fantastic. So with that, I'm going to call it a show because that was a ridiculous take on my part. And I apologize to everyone who listened for the last 40 minutes or so for that being the final take. I should probably let the other guys end it better. But thank you for listening. I want to thank Matt Trueblood and thank you to uh, for joining as well. Um, to the post-game post point, post-game pint, that's hard for me to say. 
Uh, thank you. Um, be sure to check out Twins Daily. This will be available on YouTube, um, on our Facebook page, on the Twins Daily podcast, wherever you find your podcast. I forgot to put it on Facebook Live because I'm not that smart and kind of panicked, and I haven't actually done a show since then, but most of the shows will be on Facebook Live. Uh, but again, thank you to those that participated. Jeffrey, thank you so much for uh, calling in or coming into the conversation and asking three great questions. Hopefully the Twins will be active. The trade deadline's Monday afternoon, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see the Twins do something. So with that, have yourselves a great weekend. No show after Sunday's Twins game. We'll be back on Monday to hopefully talk about a couple of Twins wins and maybe a trade. So with that, thanks again for listening. Have yourselves a great weekend. Thanks, y'all. Thanks.